let's investigate the inner product space axioms. In this video, we will see how a vector space equipped with an inner product can be used to define a Hilbert space. The concept of a Hilbert space is essential in quantum mechanics. The state vectors in quantum mechanics live in a Hilbert space. So let's get started by defining an inner product space. We're going to write down the axioms of an inner product space. These are the essential properties that must be satisfied for an abstract algebra structure to be called an inner product space. We're going to start off with some notation from a vector space. So we're going to be using Dirac notation, which is the standard notation that physics uses and chemistry as well. You might also see uh, some other notations appearing in pure maps, and I'll talk about uh, some of the variation uh, in the notation that's used later in the video. So let's write down some of our vectors. So we need to define some vectors and some scalars so that we can write down the axioms of an inner product space. So first, let's define three vectors. We call them u, v, and w. So this is u, v, and w. You can see that I'm writing them with this angled bracket over here. Now this angled bracket is used in Dirac notation. So when the angled bracket is on the right, this is called a ket. That's K-E-T, ket. And when the angled bracket is on the left, it's called a bra. So when you put a bra and a ket together, you get a bra ket or a bracket. That's where the name comes from. And a bra ket combination is used to denote the inner product. So these three vectors are elements of some vector space. I'll write capital V to denote the vector space. So this lowercase v is just an element of this vector space. Now we also need some scalars. So let's define some scalars, and we'll call them alpha and beta. So alpha and beta are scalars, and they are elements of a scalar field. And we'll call that scalar field F. So this is exactly the same uh, type of definition that we used to define a vector space. So we're already assuming that this structure over here is a vector space. It satisfies all of the vector space axioms. Now we're going to add additional structure to that vector space. And that structure is going to be called an inner product. So one thing that I want to uh, write before I write down the inner product space axioms is the bra. I'm going to define the bra vector. So the bra is actually the Hermitian conjugate of the ket. So if I take this ket version of V, and I write down the Hermitian conjugate, or the Hermitian adjoint, which is denoted by this dagger in the top right, this is equivalent to the bra version of V. You can see all I've done is I've moved this angle bracket from the right to the left. So this combination, if we, if we take a bra and we combine it with a ket, that's going to give us an inner product. And the inner product is going to combine these two vectors, and it's going to spit out a scalar. It's going to spit out a member of this field. It's an element of the field, which uh, for our purposes is actually going to be the complex numbers. But this, in principle, could also be the real numbers, and it could be some general field. So let's write down the first axiom that we're interested in today. So this axiom is called conjugate symmetry. So if I have the inner product, of two vectors, u and v, which is written like this. If I swap the order of these two guys, if I write this as the inner product of v and u, this is almost the same, but we have to take the complex conjugate, which I'll denote by a little star. So this star denotes a complex conjugate. You might also see a bar above this. That, that is also notation that is used to denote the complex conjugate. So this axiom is called conjugate symmetry. It's not symmetry. It would be symmetric if these guys were equal. It's almost symmetric. It's conjugate symmetry. It's because we have to take the complex conjugate when we swap the order. So you can see on the right, we have a ket. And on the left, we have a bra. This combination is a bra-ket in Dirac notation. And this is the Dirac notation for an inner product. In pure mathematics, as opposed to physics, you might also see brackets appearing over here, so different styles of brackets. 
And instead of a vertical line in the middle, you might see a comma. But what's important to, to, to stress is that there are two entries. We're combining two vectors together, and we're getting an output which is a member of this field. So it, uh, for our purposes, it's going to be a complex number. Or in, if we restrict it to just the real numbers, the output is going to be a real number. But it's going to be an element of the field. It's not going to be a vector. So this inner product does not produce another vector. It produces a scalar. So now we've established conjugate symmetry as one of our essential axioms for the inner product. Let's have a look at another axiom. And this axiom is called positive definiteness. If uh, we want a notion of the length of a vector, so uh, I'll write this out like this. If we want to find the norm squared of a vector, which is written like this, so the norm squared, these uh, bars around here are telling us something like the length of a vector. And if we take the length squared, that's the same as taking the inner product of a vector with itself. So that's this over here. Now, let's get to the axiom. This always has to be greater than or equal to 0. So the length of a vector is greater than or equal to 0. When is it equal to 0? It's only equal to 0 in one very special case. And that special case is when this vector is the 0 vector. So I can write this out over here. This is another related condition. If we take the inner product of a vector with itself, and we get that equal to 0, this only occurs, this is if and only if this vector v is equal to the 0 vector. And I'll use this notation for the 0 vector. Now, I'm not going to put a 0 inside of this ket, because that has a different meaning. That notation is reserved for the ground state. And the ground state is not the same as the 0 vector. This zero vector over here, that is the additive identity uh, if, if we were to look at a vector space. So if you look at the axioms for a vector space, this guy is the additive identity. So I'm using this notation to make it very clear this is not the same as that ground state vector, which would be a zero inside of this ket. So this over here is positive definiteness. We have that the inner product of a vector with itself is greater than or equal to zero, and it's only equal to zero if we're dealing with the zero vector. So this vector has to be the zero vector in order for the inner product to be equal to zero. And we can define the norm by this definition over here. So the norm squared is equal to the inner product of a vector with itself. So if we take the square root, I'll write that uh, over here. If we take the square root of this, then we can get the norm. So the norm of a vector is equal to the square root of the inner product of that vector with itself. That's the norm. And the norm is uh, just going to give us the length of the vector. So if this is an abstract vector space, uh, this might be a more abstract concept. But if we're dealing with a more concrete vector space, if we think of vectors as pointy arrows in a 3D space, then this is actually the length of the vector. So that is why this norm is very important. So we get this norm from the inner product. So we have conjugate symmetry, and we have positive definiteness. We also have an, another uh, set of axioms which are collectively known as linearity. So I'll write those down over here. If we take the inner product of a vector u with a scaled version of v, so alpha v, I'm using this scalar to scale this vector, then this is equal to alpha times the inner product of u with v. So we're allowed to move this coefficient outside. But that's only true, this is only true if we're putting the coefficient in this ket. If we put this coefficient over here on this side, then we can use conjugate symmetry up here, and we can find that we have to take the complex conjugate of this coefficient. So linearity is only present in this entry over here, not in this entry. And there's actually a convention uh, sometimes in pure maths, you'll see two different conventions. Sometimes linearity is present in the first entry, and sometimes in the second entry. So it's just a choice of notation. But in physics, this ket is where the linearity is present. And this bra is where you have to take the complex conjugate when you take out that constant. Now, a related axiom, which is also part of linearity, is when we have the sum of vectors. So this is scaling a vector, and now we can take the sum of vectors. So if we have 
the inner product of a vector u with the sum of two vectors v and w, that is equal to the inner product of u with v plus the inner product of v, uh, sorry, of u with w. So we have u with w. So all we're doing is distributing this, essentially. We're breaking this into two inner products. So this bra version of u is being applied to both members of the sum. So we have u with v and u with w. So collectively, you can think of these guys as linearity. And we can combine these two into a single axiom. So we can take these two linearity axioms and, and combine them into a single one. I'll write that underneath over here. So what we can do is we can say the inner product of u with alpha v plus beta w, so I'm using these two scalars to scale two vectors in a sum, and this is equal to alpha times the inner product of u with v plus beta times the inner product of u with w. So you can see this is very similar to what we have over here. Where we have, we've broken up this sum. We've got u with v, u with w. We also have u with v and u with w. But now we have these scalars that are scaling the vectors in the sum. So this is a linear combination of two vectors. And if we take the inner product of a vector with a linear combination, we can break that linear combination up. So this is linearity. So we've actually, we've written down the essential properties of an inner product space. We have a vector space and we've added that additional structure. We have conjugate symmetry, positive definiteness, and linearity. And I've repackaged this scaling axiom over here and this additivity axiom where we can split the sum up. I've repackaged them and I've written them as one axiom over here. And another interesting thing that we can do with this axiom is we can apply conjugate symmetry and we can flip these guys around. So let's do that. Underneath, I'm going to write the flipped version. So let's write this linear combination in the bra. We have alpha v plus beta w. We're going to take the inner product of this with u. So we've just moved the linear combination into the bra, and this bra has now turned into a ket. And this is the same as taking the complex conjugate, because swapping the order is the same as complex conjugation. So this is equal to alpha star. Now we have to take the complex conjugate of this coefficient. And then we swap the order over here. We have v with u. And then over here we have beta star. And then we have w with u. So these guys are complex conjugates of each other when we swap the order. And that's the same for these guys. w has moved over here. u has moved over here. v has moved over here. And u has moved over here. And these coefficients are in general complex numbers. They, they can be complex numbers. This field can be the complex numbers. So we have to make sure that we take the complex conjugate. And another way of interpreting this is that when you have coefficients appearing inside the bra, if you want to take those coefficients outside of the inner product, you have to take the complex conjugate. So this top line over here can be thought of as linearity, and this can be thought of as a conjugate version of linearity. So it's linear in this entry, but it's, it has this conjugate linearity in this entry over here. So these are the essential properties of an inner product space. Let's have a look at an example. And this example is something that you're familiar with. It's the Euclidean vector space. So let's consider two vectors. We'll call them uh, u and v. And I'll use the standard arrow notation for vectors, because now we're talking about the specific pointy arrows in Euclidean space. So this, this is talking about general vectors. These are general vector spaces. And now we're talking about more tangible vectors that uh, you can think of as arrows. So now we have u and v. And these guys are elements of a real vector space. And it's n-dimensional. So we'll put uh, the real numbers raised to the power of n. So this is a vector space that is n-dimensional. And it's a special type of vector space. It's the Euclidean vector space. So if this is actually the type of vector space that we live in. So this, this plane over here is a two-dimensional Euclidean vector space. And this three-dimensional space that I'm walking around in, uh, that is a three-dimensional Euclidean vector space. So these vectors are the pointy arrows. Now, let's use these vectors and combine them with an inner product. 
the inner product that we're going to be using is actually the dot product. The dot product is a special case of this general inner product structure. So if we do u dot v, that can also be written as u transpose, I'll write this little t over here for transpose v. And when we write this, what we mean is that this transpose is a row vector and that this is a column vector. And when you have a row vector, and a column vector, what you can do is you can multiply each of the corresponding components and take the sum. And that can be written like this. We can take the sum over some index, which I'll call k, of the product uk vk. So these guys are all real numbers. So all the entries in these vectors are actually real numbers. That's because we're talking about a Euclidean vector space. This is a real vector space. And the multiplication of two real numbers is commutative. So we have commutativity. We can swap this around. And if we swap this around, we can also write this as V transpose U. So now this guy is the row vector, and this guy is the column vector. So we've just swapped the roles of these two vectors. And this we can equivalently write as V dot U. So this is the dot product. And this is an element of the real numbers. So the dot product is going to give us a real number. And you can see that this is symmetric. The dot product is symmetric. It's not conjugate symmetric. So it is actually a special case of this. Because for real numbers, the complex conjugate has no effect. For real numbers, we're setting the imaginary component equal to 0. And this has the effect of negating the imaginary component. So the conjugate symmetry that we see in this inner product space axiom has a special case over here. So the dot product is a symmetric way of combining two vectors to output a scalar. And this is a real value over here, a real valued scalar. Now, let's have a look at the norm, or specifically the norm squared. So if we take this norm and write this as vector v with a little arrow on top. We want to find the norm squared. Well, we can find that by just taking the dot product of vector v with itself. And what is this going to be equal to? Well, if we take the dot product of a vector with itself, uh, it's going to have this combination over here. But u is going to be exactly the same as v. So we can write this as the sum over this index k of the absolute value of v k squared. And because we know that if we take the square of these real numbers, we're always going to get some non-negative number, then the sum of these non-negative numbers has to be non-negative. So this is greater than or equal to 0. And that's exactly the same observation that we found in this axiom over here of positive definiteness. So this is the norm squared. And then if we wanted to find the norm, all we have to do is take the square root. So the norm of a vector, or the length of a vector in a Euclidean vector space, that is equal to the square root of the dot product of this vector with itself. So that's what we've got over here. We just have to take the square root of the dot product with itself. And you can see that this is a special case of this relationship that we had up here. And when is this equal to 0? This is only equal to 0 if all of these components, all of these vk's, are equal to 0. So if all components are equal to 0, then we're dealing with the 0 vector. That's exactly this relationship over here. And the dot product is also linear. We have linearity satisfied. But an important thing to remember is that because all of these are uh, going to be real numbers for a real vector space, we don't have to worry about taking the complex conjugate, because the complex conjugate has no effect. Now, we've looked at an example of a real vector space. And we've taken that real vector space. We've equipped it with the dot product. So that's an inner product space. So this is a finite dimensional real vector space. And this is actually a Hilbert space. We have satisfied all the requirements for a Hilbert space. But now, what we want to do is have a more general example of a Hilbert space. So let's go over to a complex vector space. Now, a complex vector space defined with an inner product, we can use that to construct a Hilbert space. 
A Hilbert space is a, an inner product space with additional requirements. And those additional requirements are uh, the axiom of completeness. So we need to have this completeness axiom satisfied in addition to all of the inner product axioms. So if we have all the axioms of a vector space, all the axioms of an inner product space, and this additional completeness requirement, that is the structure that is defined as a Hilbert space. So let's have a look at a complex vector space. Now this complex vector space is actually a Hilbert space. I'll write this over here. So let's consider the vectors, I'll write them again in this uh, Dirac notation. Let's consider psi and phi. So this is psi and phi. These are Greek letters. And these are elements of a Hilbert space. And this fancy H is used to denote a Hilbert space. Now, a very important thing that we can do in this Hilbert space is that we can construct a basis. We can construct a set of basis vectors, and we can use those basis vectors to create any vector in this Hilbert space. So I'll use this notation to define the basis. In fact, I'll write it in green over here. So let's say we have, we use this little curly bracket to know that this is a set, a set, and this is K, which is labeling each of these vectors. And these guys are the basis vectors. So here we have a set of basis vectors. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct one of these general vectors out of these basis vectors. Now to do that, we're going to need the identity operator. The identity operator can be written in some interesting ways. So let's have a look at the identity operator. I'll write that identity operator over here. The identity operator can be written like this. So this, this is the notation for an identity operator. We have a fancy bold face i, and we can also put a hat to signify that it is an operator. So operators are essential in quantum mechanics. The identity operator has no effect when it acts on a state. It gives back the exact same state. So if we have an expression for the identity operator, and we act on a state, we're going to have another version or another expression for that state. So that's exactly what we want to do. We want to decompose that state into uh, a sum, a linear combination of these basis vectors. So there's going to be two cases. We're going to have a look at a discrete case and a continuous case. So let's have a look at the discrete case first. Now in the uh, discrete case, we're going to need a sum. A sum over this index k of the ket version of k followed by the bra version of k. Now, this might look a bit peculiar, because in all of these examples up here, we have just seen bra ket. Bra ket is an inner product. This is not an inner product. So this is not going to give you a scalar value. This is not going to give you a, a complex number. Instead, it's going to give you an operator. So this is a way of constructing an operator out of these vectors. So this is also known as the outer product. So this is an inner product, and this is an outer product. We have the opposite order over here. And this is where Dirac notation really gets beautiful, because it's a very convenient way of writing the inner product and the outer product. All we have to do is swap the kets and the bras. So this ket bra combination is summed over. So we have this index k, and that k labels each of these basis vectors. But let's have a look at a continuous case as well. So this is the discrete case. Now let's have a look at the continuous case. For example, position and momentum. We're going to have to turn this sum into an integral. So let's write this as the integral with respect to x of the ket version of x, and then we have the bra version of x. We can do an analogous thing for momentum the integral with respect to momentum of the ket version of p, and then the bra version of p. So these two are continuous bases. So we have continuous bases. x and p uh, have uh, a continuous spectrum. So x and p uh, fit on some interval. And that interval can go from minus infinity to plus infinity, or it can be restricted. But what's important to remember is that it is continuous. You can, if you take that, uh, that interval, you can take on any value in between the bounds of that interval. But in this case over here, we have a discrete label. So this can be infinite dimensional, but it's discrete. So that's, uh, it, 
it can be labeled by the natural numbers. We can start off with 1, 2, 3, 4, and that's how we can label these guys. That's this index k. So it's exactly what we were dealing with uh, in this example over here. We have a discrete index k. And this discrete index can be thought of as x, y, z if we're dealing with a three-dimensional real vector space. So we have the discrete basis over here, and we have the continuous basis. Now, let's apply this identity to psi. And let's apply it to the ket version of psi first. So if we do that, we're going to get this. We're going to have the identity applied from the left onto psi. And that's equal to the sum over this index k of, first we have ket k, then bra k, and then ket psi. And we can identify this as an inner product. And let me write something very important over here. This inner product over here, this is a complex number. So the field that we're interested in, this f, is the complex numbers. So this we can write as a complex coefficient. And I'll label it as alpha sub k. So now we can rewrite this sum as the sum over this index k of alpha k, and then we have this ket k. And we're allowed to move this around because this is just a complex number. Complex numbers can be moved around the bras and the cats. So you're not allowed to swap the bras and the cats because that, that's a different thing. If you have the bras and cats in this order, that's an inner product, and in this order, it's an outer product. But if you have complex coefficients, you're allowed to move them around. And the result of this inner product can be evaluated as a complex coefficient. So that's what we're using these alpha sub k's for. So this is a linear combination. It's a linear combination of the basis vectors. And that's this set of basis vectors that we have over here. Now, what I want to do is I want to apply the identity operator to the bra version of psi. And I'll switch to a different color. Let's go green over here so we can easily see uh, what is what distinguish these guys. If we have psi, the bra version of psi, we need to act from the right-hand side. So this is how Dirac notation works. If you have a ket, you act from the left-hand side. So from the left, you act on the ket. And if you have a bra, you act from the right. So this is from the right. And we also have to take the Hermitian adjoint of this operator. But have a look at this operator. It is Hermitian. That means it's equal to its Hermitian adjoint. If you, were to take, if you were to take the Hermitian adjoint of this, all you would have to do is turn the kets to bras and the bras to kets. That's what this relationship tells us over here. And if you do that, that would just swap these guys around. But they are identical, so it has no effect. The identity operator is Hermitian. So now let's write this out. This is going to be equal to the sum over k. We can bring this bra version of psi in, then we're going to have a ket k and a bra k. So have a look at what we have over here. This, again, is an inner product. And we can evaluate that inner product, and that's going to give us a complex coefficient. And what complex coefficient is it going to be? Well, if you look very carefully at this combination, it is the swapped over version that we have over here. Here we have k and then psi, and here we have psi then k. We can use conjugate symmetry to observe, that's this axiom over here, to observe that this is actually alpha k star. So this is alpha k complex conjugated. So we need to take the complex conjugate when we swap these guys around. And then we can write this more concisely as the sum over k of alpha k star and then we have the bra version of k. So in effect, what we've done is we've taken the complex conjugate of this entire sum. If you take the complex conjugate of each of the terms in the sum, these coefficients have to be complex conjugated, and the kets need to turn to bras. And then if we were to complex conjugate this again, we would get back over here. Because the complex conjugate of a bra gets you back to a ket. So taking the complex conjugate twice has no effect. You get back to where you started. Now, what we can do is we can take the inner product of psi with itself. So let's do that underneath. So we have the inner product 
of psi with itself. Now, what is that going to look like? Well, we're going to need two different indices. So first, we need to consider this. So this is equivalent to the bra version of psi. We're just applying the identity. So let's use the index k for that term. So we have the sum over k of alpha k star. And then we have the bra version of k over here. Now, I'll close the bracket, we have another sum. That's this sum over here. But we need to use a different index because we can't use the same index over here. So let's use j. We have j and k. We have sum over j of alpha j. And then we have the ket version of j. So you can see over here what we have. We have, I'll just move this forward back. We have two sums. We have two linear combinations. We have this linear combination and this linear combination. We have two different indices. We're using different indices so that we don't confuse the two indices. We can combine this into a single sum. And let's do that. I'll do that over here. We're going to get the sum over k and j. And we're going to have these coefficients multiplying together. We're going to have alpha k star times alpha j. And then we're going to have the inner product of k with j. And we can choose our basis to be orthonormal. So we can choose uh, orthogonal basis vectors, and we can choose them to be normalized. So if they're orthonormal, this is the same as the Kronecker delta symbol, because it's a discrete case. So this is the Kronecker delta symbol, delta kj. And this symbol is equal to 1 when k is equal to j, and it's equal to 0 when k is not equal to j. So it only gives a positive uh, 1 contribution if these two indices are equal to each other. So that allows us to simplify this sum. So this sum then turns into the following. We have the sum over a single index, and let's pick k for the single index. We have alpha k star alpha k. And this is the same as the sum over k of the absolute values of alpha k squared. And we know that this is greater than or equal to 0 because all of these are going to be uh, non-negative values. And uh, in the special case where all of these coefficients are equal to 0, we're dealing with the 0 vector. And if this is not a 0 vector, we can choose these coefficients such that this is equal to 1. And if we do that, that is the normalization condition. Now, one more thing that I want to do is I want to take the inner product of a general state psi with a general state phi. And I want to do that in one of these continuous bases. So we'll do that over here. The inner product of psi with phi can be written as the bra ket combination, where we first have bra psi followed by ket phi. We can express this in the discrete basis, just like we did up here. But what I want to do is I want to demonstrate how to express it in a continuous basis, like the position basis. So what we need to do is take this identity operator and insert it between the bra and the ket. And the result of that will look like this. So first, let's consider position. We will have the integral with respect to x of bra psi followed by, first we're going to have ket x followed by bra x, and then we have ket phi. So these two inner products are going to give functions. So these are going to be functions, and they're going to depend on x. And you can also see that the x is in a different order over here. And we can flip this guy around so that it's in the same order as we have over here. And when we flip them around, by conjugate symmetry, we have to take the complex conjugate. So this is going to be equivalent to the integral with respect to x of psi star as a function of x times, here we have phi as a function of x. So that is how we would express this inner product. Now let's do this in the momentum representation. So again, we insert the identity operator in between the bra and the ket. But now we do this for the momentum representation. 
And that's going to give the integral with respect to p, which is momentum. We're again going to have the bra version of psi. Then we're going to have the ket version of p. Then the bra version of p, followed by the ket version of phi. Again, these inner products are going to give us functions that depend on momentum. So over here, they were position-dependent functions, and now they're momentum-dependent functions. And we have a slightly different notation that we're going to use. We're going to use a tilde notation, because this is the momentum space representation. This order is, again, the opposite order to what we have over here. So if we were to write this as a function, we have to take the complex conjugate. So let's do that. We're going to have psi, and I'll write a tilde above, because we're in the momentum space representation. We have a complex conjugate, and this depends on p. It depends on momentum. And then we have phi, which also needs to have a tilde, and this depends on momentum. So you can see that this is how we would evaluate the inner product if we were dealing with a continuous basis. So we've expressed this in the position basis and in the momentum basis. And these guys are both continuous. And we're contrasting this with what we have above here, which is a discrete basis. So these are discrete labels that act as an index for, uh, for this ket over here. But over here, we have continuous variables, position, and momentum. And that's how we would write this. These are functions. And the reason we have this tilde over here is because this is the standard notation uh, for when we take the Fourier transform. So these functions are related to each other by the Fourier transform. If you take the Fourier transform of this function, it will take you from position space into momentum space. And if you want to go back from momentum space to position base, you also have to take the Fourier transform. But there's just a sign change. In that complex exponential, it goes from a plus i to a minus i. So that's just the sign convention, and that's how you go from position space and momentum space. And we frequently do that in quantum mechanics. We move from the position space where we're dealing with the coordinate to the momentum space. Now, what happens if these guys are the same function, like what we have up here? What happens if we take the inner product of psi with psi? I'll write that underneath. So as a special case of these two uh, expressions, if we have the inner product of psi with itself, and we want to express that in the position and momentum basis, what we can do is we can write that as the integral with respect to x of this over here. This phi is now turning into a psi. So what we're actually going to have is the absolute value of psi as a function of x squared, because we're multiplying that function by its complex conjugate at every single value of x. And that is the absolute squared of that function. And this can also be written in the momentum representation. We have the integral with respect, so we have dp over here, integral with respect to momentum. And we don't have this function anymore. We have the Fourier transform function, which is psi tilde, and it depends on p. It depends on the momentum. And we want to take the absolute value and square that. And if we set this equal to 1, then we have normalized the function. Now, what is normalization? Normalization is just uh, changing the length of the vector and making it equal to 1. Now, the reason we normalize things in quantum mechanics is so we can uh, work with probabilities. Because the probabilities have to add up to 1. And that is essential when we're actually computing expectation values and when we're looking at probability density functions. Because normalization gets rid of factors that otherwise you would have to keep dividing by all these complicated factors. So if you just normalize uh, in the definition of the vector, then you get rid of all of that tedious uh, factor division. So here is what we have. We have the inner product of psi with itself. So if you take the square root of this, you actually get the norm. But if we set this equal to 1, the square root of 1 is also going to be equal to 1. So we're not actually changing uh, the norm over here. So uh, one more thing that I want to write is when we were looking at these basis vectors over here, I'll write this in this corner down here, these basis vectors, if we take the inner product of k with j, we got this Kronecker delta symbol, k comma j. 
And this Kronecker delta symbol, as we said before, is only equal to 1 when these indices are equal. Otherwise, it's equal to 0. That is the property of orthogonality. So orthogonality is when this inner product is equal to 0. So if the inner product between two vectors is 0, then those vectors are mutually orthogonal. And if we additionally make the requirement that these guys have to be normalized, that's telling us that the inner product of each of these vectors with themselves is equal to 1. So that condition is, all right, this is k with k, that's equal to 1. So all of these guys are normalized, and all of these guys are orthogonal. You can write down a basis that is not orthonormal, but then you can use that basis, take out all of the overlaps between the vectors that are the basis vectors, and you can make all those orthogonal vectors. So you can do that in 2D space. If you have two uh, arrows pointing in random directions, what you can do is you can make them perpendicular. Now, perpendicular, that's just a special case of orthogonal when we're dealing with Euclidean space. You can make them orthogonal, and you can change their lengths, and you can make them normalized. And this is an essential property. That is the desired basis. We want an orthonormal basis because it gives us these nice little properties over here, where we can just take the inner product, and it gives us a Kronecker delta. But this is only valid for a discrete basis. If we want to go to the continuous basis, like we have here for position and momentum, this Kronecker delta is not going to work. We have to generalize this Kronecker delta to the Dirac delta function. And we'll talk more about the Dirac delta function in later videos. The Dirac delta function only really makes sense when you put it inside an integral. It is the continuous analog to this Kronecker delta function. So if you have x, which can take on a continuous number of values, uh, if you take one value of x and another value of x, that Kronecker delta function is going to be 0 unless you're looking at the exact same value of x. So if those values are equal to each other, that's when it, it turns off. So that is uh, one of the important applications of that Kronecker delta function. So this video has introduced the concept of an inner product space. We have looked at all of the inner product space axioms. Then we use that to define a Hilbert space. We looked at an example of a real vector space equipped with a dot product. That is a special example of a Hilbert space. Then we looked at a more general example of a complex vector space, which could, in principle, be infinite dimensional. And this is what we can do with the Hilbert space. There's so many important things that we can do. We can act with operators on states. And that is how we can describe quantum mechanical systems. So this is really, really essential mathematics behind quantum mechanics. And keep in mind that we've been using Dirac notation. There are other types of notation that are also used uh, as well in pure mathematics. But in physics and chemistry, Dirac notation is the best notation that you can use to describe inner products and outer products. So we will be talking more about uh, inner products and the Hilbert space in later videos. And we will also encounter uh, problems with inner product spaces that can only be fixed if we ensure that all of the criteria of the Hilbert space are satisfied. That's that completeness uh, property. So we want to uh, ensure that there are extra conditions that make this Hilbert space a very practical tool. It's a mathematical tool. Because if you think about uh, these definitions down here, they only make sense if this function psi is square integrable. We want to limit ourselves only to square integrable functions. And these integrals, because I've left them very general, can actually be specified with a domain. We can specify integrals over here. And if this is a finite domain, we want this function to be square integrable on this finite domain. And if it's an infinite domain, if it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, we want the function to vanish as x or p goes to infinity, like a Gaussian. You don't want something like a parabola or an exponential function, because that blows up as you go to infinity. So you cannot get a meaningful integral. You cannot get a convergent result that is the result of this. So what you want is a finite area underneath the curve if we're dealing with one-dimensional quantum mechanics. So that is a restriction that we would have to put on here. We would have to put the restriction that these are square integrable functions. So always keep in mind, there are these subtle nuances, these things where uh, it doesn't quite work if you include all types of vectors. You have to limit your things, uh, you have to limit yourself to more, more restrictive conditions. And that is the structure that we add to the vector space. We take the vector space, 
we add the inner product, and then we add that completeness requirement, and that gives us a Hilbert space, an extraordinarily powerful tool to describe quantum mechanical systems. You can find more about the Hilbert space if you click over 